you were with us last week, you know that we began a new sermon series. And that, of course, as you can see from the banner behind me, is the book of Philippians. We are going to work our way through this extraordinary New Testament book. And last week, we took a look at the first couple of verses as Peter... Uh, Intro, or, or as Paul rather introduced uh, the, the, the letter, we, uh, as I said last week, sometimes we quickly go run past that greeting, but there was so much in that that, uh, that we spent some time there. And so we continue this morning, and uh, we're going to begin about verse 3 of chapter 1. And before we take a look at it, uh, let me tell you about, uh, or just kind of introduce it this way. Uh, there are, uh, there's a test for depression. And in that test for depression, people are rated on a scale of 1 to 10. And, and 1 means if someone takes that test for depression and they score like a 1, it means they are the least depressed. And if they score a 10, that indicates very, very severe depression. You know, I really believe that if Paul were given that test, that he would have scored a big fat zero on that. Now, I know what you might be thinking, you might be thinking, well, no, you wouldn't have scored a zero. You just told us that the scale is one to ten. And, and zero would be off the scale, it would be off the charts. So, you know, you, you got that wrong. No, no, I, I, I don't have that wrong. I really believe that if he were given that test for depression, I really believe he would score a zero. Because when it came to joy, uh, this man's joy was absolutely off the scale. It was off the charts. No one knew how to deal with discouragement. No one knew how to deal with disappointment. No one knew how to deal with depression. No one knew uh, knew better how to deal with worry and anxiety than the Apostle Paul. I really believe from the very bottom of my heart that as Paul is writing this in somewhere between A.D. 61 and A.D. 63, I really believe that he is the happiest man in Rome. Now, for those who don't know anything about the New Testament, they don't know anything about the Apostle Paul, they, they might hear that, and they might key on one word there and go, oh, 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 okay, I get it. I, I heard you say he's the happiest man in Rome. That explains everything. Rome, the, the beautiful city. I, I mean, who can't be happy in Rome, especially in the first century? Because that's the very epicenter of culture, it is the very epicenter of pleasure. I mean, it is a pleasure seeker's paradise. Everything that you can possibly imagine, you would find. He wasn't the happiest man in Rome because it was Rome. He wasn't the happiest man in Rome because he was at the epicenter of culture and pleasure. Theaters, the games, lavish parties. He wasn't the happiest man in Rome because it was Rome. He was the happiest man in Rome. Well, no. He wasn't the happiest man in Rome because it was Rome. He wasn't the happiest man in Rome because he was at the epicenter of culture and pleasure. If you were with us last week, you know that as he's writing this from Rome, he's actually in a Roman security-type prison going to be changed later on in his life, but at this particular stay in a Roman prison, it's more minimum security, but make no mistake about it, he's still chained to a Roman soldier 
24-7. And, uh, and so he's in a Roman prison, and he's the happiest man in Rome. So how could he possibly be the happiest man in Rome when he's sitting in a Roman prison? Because Paul understood something about joy, and he understood something about happiness. And he understood that the real basis of lasting joy, that the real basis for a a profound sense of joy that is lasting, uh, he understood that it wasn't based on things like money, and it wasn't based on things like sex, and it wasn't based on things like power, and it wasn't based on things like entertainment, and it wasn't based on things like career advancement, He understood all of that. Now, it's not to say that any of those things in and of themselves is wrong. Because they're not. At least they're not when they're handled God's way and in the context of God's will. Those things, there's nothing wrong with that, those things. But Paul just understood that that wasn't the basis for real, lasting joy. He understood that joy wasn't really based on your external circumstances of life. He understood that joy wasn't based on a trouble-free life. He understood that joy wasn't all about having a pile of things. He got that. He was the happiest man in Rome because he understood what we've long expressed in kind of a cheesy acronym. Now, when I say this, you're going to go, oh, man, yeah. If you grew up in the church, you've heard this all your life as we've tried to convey what brings joy to life. And so we formed this little acronym, and we've always taught it to the kids. And again, you know, kind of cheesy. Go, what is joy? It's J. Oh, why? And what does that mean? It means Jesus, it means others, and it means you. Right? You've heard that. You've gotten that all, most of you have gotten that all your life. We say, that's what joy is. Well, listen, that might be kind of worn out, and it might be kind of cheesy, but it is rock-solid biblical. That is absolutely truth. And Paul got that. He understood that real joy came from keeping the right things in the right order. He got that. Paul was able to sit in a Roman prison, and he was able to just be saturated in joy because he kept the first thing first, He kept the second thing second, and he kept the third thing third. He understood that. He just embraced that order. Now, this is the first time as we start reading in Philippians and we get here to verse 3, verse 3 and 4, that we encounter the idea of joy. Take a look at it. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Now, one of the important themes that runs through the entire book of Philippians, these little four chapters, is this idea of joy. This is, as I said, the first time that we encounter the idea of joy, but it is not going to be the last. The idea of joy saturates the pages of this particular letter. You will find either the noun joy or you will find its verb form, rejoice, in about a dozen places. I want you to just see how much this idea of joy is found here. So we see it first of all here in verse 4. Now look down in verse 18 of chapter 1. Paul says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. And then look down in verse 25. 
Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Look at chapter 2 and verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same spirit, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Look in verse 17 of chapter 2. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, he says in verse 18, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Look down in verse 28 of chapter 2. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again are no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Look at verse 4 of chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice Look down at verse 10 of chapter 4. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at last you have revived your concern for me. Uh, You see what I mean? He's the happiest guy in Rome. Joy is everywhere. And it's because, as I said, Paul kept the first things first, the second thing second, and the third thing third. Now that first thing is Jesus. I want you to go back again to, uh, to chapter 1 and look what he says there in verse 3 as he begins to describe uh, a prayer and he tells about him praying and he, he talks about it and he says it's a prayer of joy. But he says in verse 3, I thank my God. He doesn't just thank God. I thank My God. Paul understood that he had a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. He's not just God. He is my God. I belong to Him. I am in Him. He belongs to me. I belong to Him. He's not some distant, impersonal God. He is my God. And Paul constantly had in his mind the benefit and the blessing of that relationship. And so it didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter that there was a chain on his leg and that on the other end of that chain was a Roman soldier. Paul knew, I am in Christ. And because of what I have in Christ, I am the happiest man in all the world. Listen, The fact that he kept Jesus first in his mind. The fact that he cherished his salvation and his relationship with his God more than anything is the reason why a little bit later in chapter 1 he's going to say, if you'll look down in verse 21 and 22, he's going to say, look, to live is Christ. If I I keep living, if I get through this, it's going to be about Christ. And it's going to glorify Christ and bring honor to Christ. And he says, but if I die, it is gain. I score if I die. And he says in verse 23 there, he says, I don't know what to choose. Now, what he would like, he says there in verse 23, he says, I'm hard pressed from both directions. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. Do you have a desire to depart and be with Christ? Because he says, that's better. That is better. And it's not just better when you have no quality of life here, then it's better to... No, you can be healthy and thriving and vibrant, and it's still better. And Paul understands that. He embraces Jesus Christ. He's so thankful for that relationship he has in Christ. He knows what God has prepared for him in Jesus Christ. 
And so wherever he's at, whatever he's subjected to, he is happy. And he has this sense of joy that is deep and it is lasting. I want you to take a look real quick over in the Gospel of Luke. Look at what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10. This is a, a really important passage, I think, that really informs us of why Paul, again, can just be so happy despite his circumstances. Because, again, it's about keeping Jesus and his relationship and what all that means first. Uh, here in verse 17 of Luke chapter 10, the 70 missionaries that Jesus sent out is coming back. And it says the 70 returned, and I know, want you to notice what it says there in verse 17. They returned with joy. They're excited. And I want you to see what they're excited about. They said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Uh, they are happy, they are pumped, they are excited. And, uh, and primarily, what, what we see here, it, it's all about uh, the gift they have, the performance that they've been all about as they've been going about in the name of Jesus Christ and, and even casting out demons as they taught. And they were just overwhelmed with joy. And I want you to take a look then what Jesus says in verse 18. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. So he says, yeah, I have, I have blessed you with this power. This is divine power that you've been given. But then what we have in verse 20 is actually a mild rebuke. Jesus says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. Listen, don't let your sense of joy be about the performance. Don't let it be about the popularity that you have with the masses now because of what you can do and what's being done through you. Don't let it be about the accolades that are obviously flowing from the work you're doing through Jesus Christ. Don't let it be about the gifts that you've been given. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. That the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice, he says, that your names are recorded in heaven. That's what you need to be rejoicing about. That's that number one. That's why Paul can be sitting in that prison and just be exuding joy because He is my God and I know what I have in Christ and that's why if it were left to me, I would depart and be with Him right now because in Christ, my God has something so much better for me than anything that I have here. Listen, rejoice. You know what? This is the secret to joy. Rejoice in the fact that you have a relationship with Christ. That there is, as Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. We need to learn from Paul. We need to learn from Paul. God's taking care of our biggest problem. Whatever other problem that we have, you've heard me say this before, it dwarfs in comparison to our biggest problem of sin. And I'm not minimizing problems. I'm not at all. I'm just saying God's taken care of our biggest problem. He took care of it at the cross. He took care of it at the empty tomb. He's reached down and He has rescued us. Do you think you need something, something more to really bring you joy? Do you think the secret to joy is better behaved kids? You think that's what it is? That'll give you the joy, won't it? Better behaved kids will give you real joy in life. No, no, no. A new job, that's what will give you joy in life. I'm telling you, a new job. There's where it really is. A bigger house, that'll get it. 
There's where the joy really lies in life. If you could just get that bigger, more vacation time, that's it. That's it right there. That's what we, that's how we tend to think, right? We, we in the West, we Americans, it's about bigger and it's about more. And if we could just get bigger and if we just get more, bigger churches, bigger cars, bigger houses, uh, that's the secret to joy. No, it's not. The secret to joy is a bigger vision of Jesus Christ. That's the secret to joy. A bigger vision, a better understanding of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It's not bigger muscles, and it's not a bigger house, and it's not a bigger church. It is about a bigger vision of Jesus Christ. If we have Him, we have everything that we need for joy. I want you to look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He basically says this. You can possess nothing and yet have everything. That's what we're going to see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And again, that's why we see Paul sitting in a prison saying, my joy, rejoice, always rejoice, joy, joy, joy. Because Paul understood he had, could have nothing, and yet he had everything. Look what he says here as he's writing to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Begin reading with me at verse 4. But in everything commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness. And he goes down, and look what he says in verse 9, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold, we live as punished yet not put to death. Now zero in on verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul understood that. He is my God, and because of that, in Christ, I possess all things. I want you to take a look real quick at uh, the Psalms. The 42nd Psalm is where I want you to go. As you're turning over there, what the psalmist is doing here, especially in Psalm 42 and 43, is he's wrestling with a period of depression. And he's wrestling with a period of despondency and discouragement and disillusionment. He's wrestling with all of that. Uh, But what he does is... He begins to preach to himself. That's what he does. And uh, he begins to preach to himself about the goodness of God and the grace of God and what that means and what it does. It inspires hope and joy in him. Take a look. If you go to verse 5, why are you in despair, oh my soul? See, he's talking to himself. What's the problem? Why are you so despondent? Why are you in such a... Why have you become disturbed within me? And he tells himself, Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. He's preaching to himself. Why am I so overwhelmed and down and discouraged? I belong to God. He will rescue me. He will deliver me. He will strengthen me. He belongs to me and I belong to Him. And all of those things you see there. He's going to do it again at the very end, by the way. Verse 11. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him 
the help of my countenance and my God. By the way, you see that, right? My God. My God. It's the same thing Paul's saying. He's my God. He is my God. He is my help. And then when you get down to the 43rd Psalm, you're going to see almost the same exact words. Look down there in verse 5. Uh, why are you disturbed within me, hoping God? For I shall again praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. Listen, that's what you need to do when you're just feeling those moments of despair and despondency. We need to preach to ourselves the gospel. We need to stop listening to the voices of culture that tells us, here's where happiness is. You'll be happy if... You'll be happy if you get this, if you do this. We need to stop listening to those voices. And what we need to do is we need to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ. And we need to dwell in God's Word. And we need to get dwell in God's presence. We need to be with God's people. We need to sit at the teaching of God's Word. We need to be absorbed in that relationship that we have with God. That's the secret to joy. Well, back to Philippians 1 real quickly. There's another thing here. There's actually two things we begin to see here in verse 3. Not only Paul's joy is linked to the fact that he's so conscious of his relationship with my God. It's all about Jesus. It's that order. But as I said, it's keeping first things first, and it's keeping second things second. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. We will have time as we continue on through this series and we'll come back to points like this. But the second thing that we see here is, um, look what he says in verse 3. I think my God, he's first dwelling on that, in all my remembrance of you. And he's going to go on to say at the end of verse 4, my every prayer for you all. That's, Jesus first, that's other second. You know, what Paul could have done is he was thinking about Philippi, and we talked a little bit about the founding of the church at Philippi. That's Luke records for us in Acts 16. We talked about it a little bit last week. If you went back and you read that moment where that church was founded, Paul, as he's thinking back on that, that, that time in Philippi 10 years earlier, he could have thought about some stuff that wasn't exactly pleasant this demon-possessed girl that was really hampering him preaching the gospel, his arrest, his beating, his imprisonment, his being banned from the city. He could have been thinking about all of that stuff. But he doesn't think about all of that stuff. Uh, He doesn't think about all of those frustrations. He thinks about them. I remember... You, I remember all of you. And, he record, and he's thinking about all of these positive, these positive recollections. Thanks for the memories, he's saying. Your life has blessed me and the memories of you and, and, and your conversion and your growth and your participation with me in my ministry and your perseverance in the faith. All of that brings me joy. Listen, do you think about others a lot? Do you think about other people? Do you thank God for Do you appreciate what value people bring to your life? Do you think about that? And do you thank God for that? Do you appreciate that? If you look at Paul's life, not just here in the book of Philippians, but all through the New Testament, he rarely thanks God for things. He just rarely does. He thanks God for people. Because he understands how important people are in his life, in his walk with God, and the contributions that they've made to his life, the blessing that they've been to his life, And so it doesn't matter where he's sitting. He's thinking about what he has in God, first of all, and what he has as a result, ultimately, of being in God, Christ, uh, being belonging to God through Christ. And then the second thing that he's thinking about that no Roman prison could take away is all the love that has been shown to him from other people of faith. And he 
cherishes that. And he dwells on that. And the great thing is this. It's not because they're perfect. You know, we, we get over into chapter 4 and we're going to read about how, you know, there's still some things there. People are people. But Paul doesn't wait for people to be perfect before he shows them gratitude and before he's grateful to them. Uh, he doesn't overlook problems. He deals with problems. But he's able to rejoice despite those problems. Listen, you want to have real joy in life. It's about that. It's about keeping the first things first, the second things second, and the third things third. That's what it's about. And that's what we see right here at the beginning of this letter that is saturated in joy. Paul was the happiest man in Rome because he never forgot what he has in Christ. And he never forgot what his brethren mean to him, what people mean to him. He didn't just think about his calendar. He just didn't think about his stuff. He didn't just think about his things. He was way down there at the bottom. It was Jesus first and then others. That's the secret to lasting joy. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful as we think about what you have delivered to us this morning in this little book of Philippians. And you have shown us this extraordinary servant of yours, Paul, who was so full of joy. And Father, you are instructing us through his words and his life. And I pray that we will all be instructed. Father, I pray that we'll all find joy in you and joy in others. And Father, I pray that we will all be quick to thank you for what we have in Christ. And thank you for what we have in others. Father, I know there's people struggling with doubt and despair and despondency and discouragement. And I pray, Father, that they'll open their hearts to your word. We know it doesn't make challenges and difficulties and circumstances of this life go away. But Father, I pray that they will find some peace and that they will find some strength in those matters and in those moments of struggle. And Father, it's in your name, your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, we close with an invitation of Jesus Christ because as we have said, that's where real joy is found. It is in Christ. And so if you are not there and you want to experience the great joy that's found only in Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you that chance this morning. Confess Him as the risen Lord. Surrender your life to Him. Be buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. He's promised at that time, that place, He's going to meet you in your faith. He's going to wash all of your sins away. You're going to become one of His. And as one of His, there's going to be this amazing inheritance that is laid up for you that no one can take away. No one can take it away. You hold on to Jesus Christ. It's going to be your circumstances of life. Can't take it away. That can be yours this morning. And so if you haven't obeyed the gospel, we would encourage you to do that. We'd love to share with you in that great moment of freedom and forgiveness. If you've done that, but you have wandered away, if you've let the world get into your heart and in your mind too much, you've been distracted, you have a misplaced sense of happiness and joy now, again, I hope that you've opened your heart to the teaching of God's Word, and you understand where real joy lies, and that you'll come back to the only true source of joy, Jesus Christ. And if you need to do that in a public way, we want to encourage it. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. And so if you have a spiritual need that you need to take care of, why don't you do it right this moment? Let's together and stand.